What will change in Ukraine's war after Putin's annexation of four significant territories in Ukraine? And has India's external affairs minister, Dr. S. Jay Shankar's recent US troop deepened existing ties with America? Hello and a very warm welcome to World 360 with me, Akanksha Sraou. We'll try and deep dive into those questions, but first up are the headlines. Russia vetoes the UN resolution condemning Ukraine's annexation of Donetsk, Lohansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia. India and China choose to abstain. CNN News 18 reports from Ground Zero. In a high-on-substance 10-day visit, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar places India-US relations on fast track, addressing critical issues like Kashmir and the visa backlog. Calling the Nord Stream gas pipeline leaks a sabotage, the NATO warns of climate risk. And post tropical cyclone Ian lashes South Carolina in a second US landfall. In a major escalation of the Ukraine war, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the annexation of four occupied Ukrainian territories. These are Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson and they comprise 15% of Ukraine's territory. It's the largest forced annexation of land in Europe since 1945. And it's in line with Russia's previous attempts to expand its territory. Now remember, in 2014, Putin had annexed Ukraine's Crimea as well. Now prior to this annexation on Friday, Russia had called a referendum earlier, which has been labelled as a sham by Ukraine and the West. Now despite condemnations pouring in from across the world, including the UN chief, Putin has taken control of the four territories. Delivering a speech during the annexation ceremony, Putin stated that the West began its colonial policy in the Middle Ages. He referred to the plunder of loot in both India and Africa as well, saying that the West wanted to colonize Russia. Western governments have announced a new wave of sanctions and vowed not to recognize the regions as part of Russian territory. Understandably, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has called the referendums and subsequent annexations a farce. Listen it. The entire territory of our country will be liberated from this enemy. The enemy not only of Ukraine, but also of life itself, humanity, law and truth. Russia already knows this. It feels our power. It sees that it is here in Ukraine that we prove the strength of our values. And that is why it is in a hurry, organizes this farce with the attempted annexation, tries to steal something that does not belong to it, wants to rewrite history and redraw borders with murders, torture, blackmail and lies. Ukraine will not allow that. And we're fully prepared to defend it. I want to say this again. America is fully prepared with our NATO allies to defend every single inch of NATO territory. Every single inch. So, Mr. Putin, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Every inch. And I have to be, I've been in close touch with, uh, with our uh, allies. Uh, we're announcing uh, new sanctions today as well. But that's not all. Russia has vetoed a UN resolution. Now, this resolution condemned the Kremlin's annexation and referendums, declaring them as illegal and invalid. The UN has urged all countries not to recognize any annexation of the territory claimed by Moscow. Four countries abstained from the vote, including India, China, Brazil and Gabon. Here's what India's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ruchi Rakamboj, had to say. Dialogue is the only answer to settling differences and disputes, however daunting that may appear at this moment. The path to peace requires us to keep all channels of diplomacy open. India's Prime Minister has also emphasized that this cannot be an era of war. We therefore sincerely hope for an early resumption of peace talks to bring about an immediate ceasefire and resolution of the conflict. 
Now, CNN News 18 is one of the few channels which continue to bring you a ground zero report and joining us live from Car Cave right now is my colleague Sanjay Suri. Sanjay, thank you so much uh, for joining in on our show. Now, let me ask you, does this annexation hold any merit because the UN has called it a violation? Tell us more about the reaction in Ukraine and from around the world. This annexation as announced by Putin is not going to be accepted in Ukraine. It's not going to be accepted around the world. There has been some ambivalence at the United Nations uh, resolution on this. India has abstained, but that is not to say that India has endorsed uh, this move either. It's very unlikely that any of Russia's allies will align themselves with this move either. We've had China express misgivings. Israel, a close friend of Russia, has said definitely that it will not. It has been rejected by Serbia. So this is not going to be easy for Putin to get away with whatever it looks like on the map and uh, in the plans. All right. Also, whether it's for the war or the sentiments within Ukraine, how does Russia's hostile move board for the uncertain situation on the ground level? It's not clear what the picture is in Zaporizhia, which is now under divided control. The town itself is under Ukrainian control. The area around is occupied by Russian forces. So when Putin claims the whole of that territory as a part of Russia, what happens to the town center? Will there be a new conflict there? Will this mean street to street fighting? We've also seen pockets of Donetsk region in Ukrainian hands. Again, there is a question what happens there. Beyond that, there is a further question whether Russia can really take over this whole eastern belt of Ukraine, now claimed to be the western fringe of a new and a newly expanded Russia, whether Russia can really take charge of these areas and run them as if they were, as a matter of course, a part of Russia, a new part of Russia. This whole move is not ending the conflict. It is, in fact, entrenching the conflict. It's going to be the start of new tensions, new confrontations, and these are certain to continue for a very long time. Absolutely. Many thanks to you, Sanjay Suri, for bringing in that report from Ground Zero. Let's also try and get in a sense of perspective in terms of what this will mean for the ongoing conflict, not just for Ukraine, but Russia as well. And for that, I'm joined in by Mr. Fred Weir, who's a Russian affairs expert. Thank you so much, Mr. Weir, for joining in on World 360. Uh, now, how significant in your view is this annexation? Uh, remember, Crimea was annexed by Russia in 2014 as well. It still remains under Russian control. But the UN chief has called the recent annexation a violation of international law. Does that hold any merit? Well, it's tremendously significant. It does change the entire complexion of this conflict. I think uh, it's, you know, P President Putin has his own historical rationale for why these lands belong in Russia. And uh, indeed, uh, until recently in history, that is the way these kind of questions were settled, I mean, by force of arms. But since World War II, we've had an international system that uh, is based on sovereign states, which exist within a certain defined uh, territory and are members of the United Nations. Um, and even if there have been a few um, um, violations of that, like Israel sometimes annexes other people's territory. Kosovo famously was wrenched out of the bowels of S Serbia by war, by a NATO-launched war. But in general, that system has held. Um, and, uh, you know, since World War II, and uh, Putin has, is launching a full-scale challenge to that. Um, it's going to be taken that way by most of the world. I think we know that already, but lots of countries that might otherwise be friendly to Russia aren't going to recognize these annexations precisely because it goes against the fundamental world order. Right. Fred, it's also important to talk about the role of UN and at the UNSC, what's just happened. What happens now that Russia has vetoed the UN resolution with China and India having abstained from voting? Well, the, the, the lineup on the 
<clears throat> UN Security Council is, um, of course, Russia, China, and three Western powers, uh, and um, then a, a, a group of, of secondary members of the Security Council. So um, <clears throat> I think as long as the Security Council is the way it is, um, no anti-Russian resolutions are going to get through. And that's why you can only have the condemnation, which will probably emerge from the General Assembly, which only is, um, you know, isn't a binding resolution. Only the Security Council can do that. So in this sense, the EU, United Nations is, is kind of helpless in this situation. Right. Many thanks to you, Fred, Weir, for sharing in your precious insights on this new story. And with that, let's also shift our attention over to India, which had been making headlines in the United States. India's external affairs minister, Dr. S.J. Shankar, has placed India-U.S. relations now on a fast track. Jay Shankar's 10-day visit to the United States was high on substance. Whether it was the issue of Kashmir or even Western media's narrative, or the issue of US visa wait time, Jay Shankar called a spade a spade. Here's a look at some of the most hard hitting statements made by India's foreign minister. On mobility, specifically visas, uh, this is particularly crucial given its centrality to education, business, technology, and family reunions. There have been some challenges of late. Uh, and uh, I flag it to Secretary Blinken and his team, and I have every confidence that they will look at some of these problems seriously and positively. I look at media. You know, there are I mean, you, there are some newspapers. You know exactly what they're going to write, including one in this town. It is important to contest. It is important because the the most of the Americans, you know, they would not know what, sort of the nuances and the complexities of our world. If you look at the whole 370 issue, what was a temporary provision of the constitution was finally put to rest. This was supposed to be majoritarian. Now tell me what was happening in Kashmir was not majoritarian. Very honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship that has neither ended up serving Pakistan well, nor serving American interests well. So it is really for the United States today to reflect whether this, you know, what are the merits of this relationship? What do they get by, uh, by keeping it uh, sort of uh, uh, continued? Having borne the brunt of cross-border terrorism for decades, India firmly advocates a zero-tolerance approach. In our view, there is no justification for any act of terrorism, regardless of motivation, and no rhetoric, however sanctimonious, can ever cover up bloodstains. So what has been the impact of uh, Jay Shankar's visit? How nuanced is the relationship now between India and the United States? Let's try and get in a sense of perspective. And for that, I'm joined in by Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, who's a former diplomat. Uh, many thanks to you, Ambassador, for joining in on our show. Now, Mr. Jay Shankar rightly called out Pakistan's role in sponsoring terrorism. But should India be rattled at all by the U.S. sustenance assistance to Pakistan on F-16s? I think it is. it was very important to, to state what Dr. Jay Shankar had stated. To be very frank, uh, Pakistan is a blind spot in the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but Pakistan is like a hired gun, which is uh, which is willing to be used uh, for a fistful of dollars when required, and that is why uh, Pakistan becomes important for the U.S. Now, just compare how the U.S. has gone after Al Qaeda operatives and how they have treated Hafez Saeed, on whom there's a ten million dollar bounty with kid gloves. Right. So that is uh, a fact and the weapons applied to Pakistan by the U.S. have always been used against India. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no comparison between India-U.S. relations and U.S.-PAK relations. Uh, India-U.S. relations have blossomed. They are the, one of the most important relationships. It's a forward-looking relationship, very deep, comprehensive. Whereas in the case of U.S.-Pakistan, it has contained right. the negatives.
Very well said, Ambassador. At the same time, Ambassador, how crucial is the issue of visa wait time for India-US relationship considering the visiting visa wait time for Beijing is just two days and Islamabad's is only 450 days, almost half of New Delhi's wait time. Well, I would not like to enter into comparison, but, uh, you know, let me uh, give you my perspective. I have just come back from the U.S. I was there for uh, a few weeks. And I do find that U.S. has yet to recover from the COVID blues. And every establishment is hiring. There is unemployment is at a historic low. Uh, so what the secretary said about manpower shortages is correct. But at the same time, uh, you know, this kind of an inordinate delay uh, is only disruptive. It causes difficulties for Indians and it, and, and it deprives the U.S. for revenue, for example, of Indian students and visas. I wish that they had anticipated that after COVID, the pent up demand and had adjusted or prepared well. It is reassuring that the Secretary of State is alive to the challenges, but I think that change will happen sooner than later. Uh, will late, it will take time and that the applicants need to wait. Uh, we'll have to wait before things get better. Uh, that is a reality and uh, that we need to reckon with, but it's important and useful that this was highlighted. Absolutely. And he was hoping that that change happens very soon, as has been promised by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Many thanks to you, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, for joining in on World 360. And with that, let's now shift our attention over to the gas pipeline leaks, which have created headlines all over the world. Earlier this week, unexplained and sudden leaks were discovered in the Nord Stream pipelines that run under the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany. Now, this pipeline is also Germany's main source of Russian gas. The blame game has already begun between the West and Russia over who is responsible for these leaks. NATO has also come on record to say it's a deliberate act of sabotage, saying that it would be met with a collective response. Meanwhile, EU nations are conducting investigations into how the damage occurred, but there's a worry over the impact this is going to have on the environment as well. More than 100,000 metric tons of natural gas is bubbling to the surface over a one kilometer area. Nearly 90% of that is methane, a greenhouse gas with more than 80 times the global warming power of carbon dioxide. For more details, uh, I'm also joined in by our CNN correspondent, Claire Sebastian, who's joining me live from London at this hour. Claire, thank you for joining in. Now, who's being blamed for this sabotage and why? That's the most uh, important and crucial question that comes to mind. from the Swedish and Danish governments uh, who told the UN Security Council on Thursday that uh, the explosions that caused damage to the pipeline were consistent with several hundred kilos uh, of explosives and they believed that was likely uh, a deliberate act. Very few people pointing the finger at Russia, although suspicion is mounting around that. We heard uh, from Western security officials, Western intelligence officials said that uh, Russian Navy ships were in the vicinity uh, of where the leaks of these pipelines were discovered on Monday and Tuesday of this week. They do routinely patrol the Baltic Sea, but that is still leading to increase suspicion. I should note, though, that the investigations are ongoing. And in actual fact, the gas is still leaking out of these pipelines. And according to the operator uh, of the Nord Stream pipelines, Nord Stream AG is expected to continue leaking uh, until October the 2nd. They said that's this Sunday. Uh, so until it stops leaking, they really can't investigate in earnest what these leaks look like and what exactly uh, might have caused them. So it is still early days in discovering what has happened. As for Russia, though, Russia is blaming the West. President Putin, in his speech uh, on Friday, where he announced the annexation of four Ukrainian territories, also blamed what he called Anglo-Saxons uh, for the leaks in the Nord Stream pipeline. They also right. say it's sabotage. Uh, but of course, as I said, still <clears throat> early days in finding out the real truth as to what happened. Right. Claire, there's already been an energy crisis triggered uh, by Russia in Europe. How have these gas leaks in Nord Stream now impacted European gas prices in the market? 
Yeah, so we did see a spike in gas prices on Wednesday when this news came out, continuing into Thursday. Uh, and that was significant because gas prices have been falling really for the past month, ever since they really shot higher at the end of August uh, when Russia cut the flows through the Nord Stream 1 to zero. Now gas prices, though, in Europe coming back down uh, a little bit. EU energy ministers have been meeting today uh, to try to come up with a way of bringing these prices down, of containing uh, this crisis. And they have announced new measures, including uh, a mandatory reduction in electricity consumption, including uh, a, a contribution, a solidarity contribution by fossil fuel companies and a cap on revenues uh, from some electricity producers. So that is calming the market somewhat. But obviously the leaks in the Nord Stream, particularly the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which was the only one that was uh, operational uh, at all this year, uh, is significant because it really just draws a line under any hope that that Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which up until early June was responsible for, for about 40% of Europe's gas imports from Russia. So really the single biggest artery pumping natural gas from Russia into Europe. There's really now no hope of it coming back online this winter. So it really puts the urgency uh, on Europe to, to continue cutting demand, con to continue diversifying supply, mm -hmm. to avoid shortages this winter. Absolutely. Many thanks to you, Claire Sebastian, for bringing in all the latest. And with that, we quickly shift our attention over to the United Kingdom. UK's Prime Minister Liz Truss is now facing backlash over her divisive economic plan, which brings in tax cuts and even deregulations. But she's come out in defense of it, despite its effect on financial markets. The pound hit a 37-year low. Truss said that she's willing to make difficult decisions in order to get UK's economy back on track. CNN's Christiane Amanpour spoke with the IMF's managing director about the situation. Let's listen into what she has to say. How does the madness that affects energy prices, for instance, or food insecurity, how does that stop? We need to recognize that the world has changed. It is much more shock prone than it used to be. And we have to think how we build resilience to these shocks. From the IMF standpoint, we see two most important factors. One, a stubborn inflation has to be fought with stubborn actions of central banks because price stability is critical for investors to invest and for consumers to consume. And let's remember, inflation is a tax on the poor. Two, make sure that support that is provided doesn't go to everybody, that it goes to the people in highest need. Okay, but that's not happening in the UK, for instance. Well, it is important to think that this compounded impact of multiple crises is already testing the patience and resilience of people. And if we don't take action to support the most vulnerable, there would be consequences, people on the street. And with that, it's time to slip into a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we'll be back with news on Xi Jinping and Hurricane Ian.